born in Spain, as you know. Um, grew up there in Spain. I did my studies in France. While in France, the, the years that I spent there, many of those uh, weekends I spent them in Switzerland. Then um, in Canada, in Toronto, um, with a predominantly white church in Toronto, Canadian, a few years there. Then we moved to Vancouver for a few years, uh, pastoring a district, Hispanic district, um, mostly Central American. After a few years there, we were called to go to the mission field. That's how I call the U.S. We went to the U.S., to Maryland, Hagerstown to be more specific, large church, a little bigger than this one probably, um, with mostly whites, um, other cultures as well. And then here we are uh, in Henderson, where there are more cultures than members themselves. And it's a very interesting picture. Uh, it, it, it is very interesting to move around and to minister to and learn from people from different languages, cultures, shapes, forms, accents. I'm not the only one. That's so cool. It, it is amazing because growing up as a Spaniard, I was only exposed to one way of thinking. And as soon as I went to college in France, I was like, whoa, there are people here that think different. And they are teaching me something different, uh, different uh, connotations of the same truth, if you wish, but it's still, uh, there were different traditions. Visiting is something that I enjoy doing, so I would go visiting people and, and, and youth of my age. I was young, and, and then when I was in the other churches with older folks as well, I was exposed to many things that have made me, I believe, uh, I don't know if a better person, but a more understanding person. At the same time, it has exposed me to the ugly side of many homes. You know, the other day, uh, I was uh, chatting with uh, one of you, when a young adult from here, and, and this person, this young adult, asked me, so what is it like being a pastor? What's the good, the bad, and the ugly? Now, he didn't ask that, but I told him the good, the bad, and the ugly. I told him the good thing is that you are on the first row and you have the great controversy unfold in front of your eyes. You see miracles every day. And you see the devil working every day. And you see Satan being crushed down. And you see God being lifted up. And you see that. In part of that great controversy, you see Satan's influencing people because when you're focused on yourself you can only see satan's influence in yourself but when you are focused on other people you see what satan does to other people and based on that i've been in homes where i don't want to say men i'm going to say males acted in a way that hurt just looking at that. I've been in homes where he sits at the table and his wife does all the work and she doesn't eat. Not just sit down, but she doesn't eat until everybody has eaten. I've been in homes where he yells at his wife and children for no apparent reason. That's the the fourth volume of his voice is screaming almost, yelling, complaining, putting people down. I've been in homes where he doesn't say a word 
while his wife and children are being mistreated by somebody else. Where he beats his children in front of his wife. Homes where he ridicules his wife in front of his peers. In homes where he goes to the bar while his wife is putting the kids to bed. You see, so those are very obvious, very obvious signs of the great controversy with Satan is actually panning down and influencing men, males, to act in such an not only a disgusting way, but yeah, it is disgusting. But, you know, the more and more you visit, the more and more homes you see, you find things that are more subtle, more socially accepted, but equally influenced by the great controversy. Oh, but, you know, that happens in low-class homes. You know, these this men doing like that, you know, wearing the, the, the white beaters, uh, that's happening in low-income homes where, where, where they, 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 no, 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 no. The, these men are chauvinists, you know, people without proper education. Well, I've been in wealthy and educated homes, multi-million dollar property homes, where he lives to work before his children wake up and come back, comes back after they go to bed. He makes sure that his children go to an expensive private school, but doesn't have a meaningful relationship with them. Where he stays longer hours at work because he doesn't want to have to deal with his wife and children at home. And he's always on these business trips. And then he buys presents to his children in order to compensate for the lack of relationship. Just to buy, to buy their affection. Where he buys expensive gifts to his wife while cheating on her during his business trips. She's not been exposed to those things. Some of, th some of them are very obvious. Some of them are very subtle. But it doesn't matter, obvious or subtle. The point is that broken homes are Everywhere. Wives and children are missing their husbands and dads, even if they all live under the same roof. Homes are broken by violence and chauvinism, but also by absenteeism and indifference. Homes are broken when a father leaves but also when a father fails to lead. You see, we, we lack men. Oh, but, but, but we have plenty of males. But we need men. We need men of God. Our families need men of God. Husbands and fathers that lead their wives and children. Now I know this is a... Uh, 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 a touchy subject. You know, we, we, we don't want to sound too chauvinist, traditionalist, and conservative or whatnot. We don't want to start talking about the whole thing of wives submit to your husbands and the whole thing there. Uh, I know it's not politically correct to say that. But the problem is not about being politically correct or not. The problem is that we have males not men, but males who think that they have the right to lead their families. They think it's a right to lead them. They think that they are entitled to lead because of their gender. The problem lies on having the grown attitude and focusing on the grown person. I don't care if you are an elder at church. It doesn't matter if you're the first elder, second elder, fifth elder. It doesn't matter if you're a deacon. It doesn't matter if you come and sing here. It doesn't matter if you preach from the pulpit. All those things don't give you the right, don't give us the right to lead our families. 
If we think it gives us the right, that means that we are looking at ourselves. That the attitude is on focusing on us, but that's the grown person. Males focus on themselves, on what they do. But men focus on being like Jesus. It is very different. Doing more puts a male in control. And say, I'm the husband, I'm the father in this family, you are going to do what I say. That's what a, a male does. But being like Jesus, being more, puts God in control. Doing more lets a male pick the changes he needs to make. As in, with the best intention in the world, says, oh, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to be a better man, I'm going to do this, this, and that. But it's not about doing it's not about us choosing what changes to make. Being more allows God to reveal the changes a man needs to be, a man needs to make. We need to be told by God what the changes are. He is in control. Doing more requires trying harder. But I work hard. I spend the whole day outside working for you. And you, when I get home, this is what you say to me? After all what I'm doing for this family? But it's not about trying harder. Being more relies on training humbly under the, right, under the direction of God. Doing more develops spiritual pride. <gasps> I've been elected to have this and this and that role in church. You know? <laughs> that makes me, makes me important. But being more produces humility through surrender. Doing more attaches to the public persona being more reaches the private self, the man God wants to reach. What needs to be done, what's needed, is a renovation of the heart before a renovation of the lifestyle. It doesn't matter what, we, what it looks outside. It doesn't matter what I do to impress people. It doesn't matter my position. It doesn't matter my gender. What matters is a renovation of the heart inside me, surrendered to Jesus. And, and you know, uh, this could probably be good for a, a men's ministry um, weekend like we had a few months ago, but this is not just for men. This is not for married men with children. This is for young men, even if they are not dating. For ladies that are not dating to know what kind of person they should put their eyes on. It is for everybody. It is for everybody. God is looking for the man who will not be afraid to identify with Jesus. That's the main thing. To move beyond the male status. Guys. Let's ask ourselves, who am I? <laughs> you know, okay, I, I gotta do that for the sake of the youth. Nah, for my own sake, come on. Um, I love Spider Man, and at the end of, I don't know, it's the first, second, third, or fifth movie, or whatever, he says, Who am I? Because he's trying to find himself, Who am I? And then at the end, he says, I'm a Spider Man, <laughs> right? And, oh, I grew up with that. I'm a Spider-Man. Who am I? I'm a Spider-Man. Who am I? I'm a man of God. I'm a man of God. And I'm going to go through ups and downs, but it's not about me, my own strength, my own superpowers. It is, it is me as a son of God, a man of God that humbles himself and lets God direct 
tell him, tell me what changes I need to make, what changes he needs to make on me, rather. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. That's what we need. God is always on the alert, constantly on the lookout for men who are totally committed to him. God is looking for men who will not be afraid to identify with Jesus. But, but yes, the Bible says, wives, submit to your husbands. And then the Bible says, the husbands are like the, the, the priests of their homes. But, yes, but the Bible also says that we need to treat our wives, our families, like Jesus treated and how Jesus related to his church. And in, Pro, in Second Chronicles says that God is looking out everywhere for men to commit, that are committed to him. People that identify Jesus, not as the role of Jesus, son of God, not as the role of Jesus, the spiritual father of everybody, not as the role of Jesus, the king. But to identify with Jesus when he fasted for 40 days. To identify with Jesus when he spent entire nights praying. When nobody saw him and he was praying. To identify with Jesus when he humbled himself and washed his disciples' feet. To identify with Jesus when he offered himself in sacrifice. That's the Jesus we need to identify with. It's not with Jesus' gender. It's in the way that Jesus, that Jesus related to the church and sacrificed himself, him being the king, him being the son of God, he, him being the most powerful, him being the creator, he himself humbled to the point sacrifice himself on the cross, to wash his disciples' feet, to fast for 40 days and 40 nights, to be ready, he himself, to be ready to talk with a human. That's, that's what we need to listen to. Males identify with the gender of Jesus. Men Identify with the love, sacrificing love and humbly attitude of Jesus. We turn on the TV. We log on Netflix. And we see males surrounded by these beautiful, skinny, impossibly skinny ladies. And... And they do all this, they are their macho men. And, <laughs> and I'm sitting with my belly, the iPad on my belly. This is a very good place to put an iPad. And I see if I didn't like pastries and, and sugar as much as I do, maybe I could look like him. And we go like that. But in the, in, the, in the side, inside our mind, those images that we are seeing of the man. <laughs> Actually, I thought to impersonate today the, the, the guy that looked at me, the one from Old Spice. But I, I won't impersonate that today just because it doesn't uh, match the color of my skin, not because of the muscles, right? But when we see those commercials of, look at me, and I look at, you're mad. Now look at me again. You know, those are funny. We click like on Facebook. We share them. But those things get in the back of our mind. In church as well. Everywhere. We need to transition. We need to turn off that. I'm not saying to, to throw your iPad. I'm saying we need to turn off that mentality that the media is bombarding us with. And we need to transition. 
But even in that transition, it's going to be like a desert. No, like a desert. <laughs> it's going to be like a desert experience. Because the transition from being a male to being a man, a man of God, is not easy to do. It is not. Once you decide to fully commit to Jesus, you will go through the inevitable desert experience. The Bible gives us insight into how this transformation of character happened. Think of Joseph in an Egyptian jail, Moses in the desert, David's fugitive ears, Jonah in the stinking well, King Nebuchadnezzar, that king, <laughs> going from riches to rocks, eating grass to revelation. The Apostle Paul blinded encounter with God. You want to be a man? That's the right thing to do. Be a man of God, but it's not going to be easy. But it's worth it. Don't give up, though. Pray. Pray continuously because it's hard to sin and pray simultaneously. Obey. Obey Jesus completely because with 80 20 obedience, the 20 always sinks you. Persevere. Because God is not looking for perfection. He's looking for and rewarding perseverance. James, we are studying James this week. James says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. That persevering and that reward is what we need. Not a six-pack or one pack like mine. It's, 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 it's not the outside. It's not our title. It's our fight, the right fight, which is to let God take control of us. Pray, obey, persevere, and be humble. Because coming face to face with God should lead a man into the only appropriate attitude, which is one of humility. And Jesus will be with you all the way. My power is made perfect in weakness, said Paul. For though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. Proverbs. And now, now that you have humbled yourself before God, now that you have, now that you can identify with Jesus' life of service, now that you have a selfless attitude, now that you have learned to obey God, now. You can look around and see your wonderful life. It is now when you look around and you look at your wife and you look at your children or you look at your girlfriend and you look at your mom. When you have identified humbly before God, identified with Jesus before God. And then you look around, you look you look from the outside. And now you look at your wife, smiling almost all the time. Smiling, beautiful, almost perfect from the outside. In picture frames, you see your beautiful wife, always smiling. But though on the inside, you will be able to hear something different. You see, when we act like males, we put ourselves on top of everybody else, in our family, in our relationships. We look at the difference. When we humble ourselves before God, we look at people 
inside them. We can start to listen to them, not just to tell them, but to listen to them. And then we may find that our wife might be saying, lead me with strong hands. Stand up when I can't. Don't leave me hungry for love. You are chasing dreams. You want a better car. You want a better position in your company. All those dreams, all your businesses, all that status that you have. But what about us? What about me? Are you looking at me? Are you looking at our children? Show me that you are willing to fight. That I'm still the love of your life. Now that you have humbled yourself before God, look around. Look around. And see your children. See their faces. Look in their innocent eyes. Mostly. They are just children from the outside. Doesn't matter if they are teenagers or not, they are children for you. You are working hard. You tell yourself they will be fine. It's okay, you cannot see them that much, but you are providing for them. You are providing for their clothes, for their toys, for their education. And that's how it does it. That's how it works when you're a male and you focus on yourself. I am providing for my family. I am doing this. But when you humble yourself before God, when you identify with the Jesus life of service, then you want to know the inside of your children. You want to know what their needs are. You want to know what they are thinking. What changes are they going through at the school? You want to know more. And then you will, able, you will be able probably to listen to them when they say inside, lead us. Daddy, lead us with a strong hands. Stand up when we can't. Don't leave us hungry for love. Chasing dreams, Daddy. But what about us? Do you pray with me? Something that pierces my heart every time when I'm busy. I come home from visiting. And I have to do something else, prepare for something else. And my little one says, can you play with me? And so often I say, sorry that I can't. And I hear myself saying that. And it's like, a, oh. I want to humble myself and not think of what I do. And how many good things I do for church or for God or wherever. I am a daddy. I want to hear my daughters. I want to hear my children. I want to spend time with them. I want to spend an extra half an hour if I have to, putting them to bed. Even if after that I'm going to have to spend more time at night preparing for something for the next day. Because that's them. It's their lives. I want to see their needs. They might be telling me. They might be telling you, show us that you are willing to fight. You know, it's not just a superhero thing of fighting um, whatever. It's fighting the demons in our head. It's fighting the, the, the influence that we get from outside. It's fighting the, 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 the attitude of being a male, the attitude of being independent. It's, it's fighting those things. Daddy, show me that you fight those things and you're going to be my daddy because that's what I want you to be. That we are still the love of your life. Paul said... In Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. A man needs to be broken as Jesus was on the cross. To have the right, no, to have the privilege, the responsibility, the weight of lovingly 
leading his family and fighting for his family. Now, as a man of God, you lead them with a strong hands not to oppress, but to stand up when they can't. You won't leave them hungry for love with chase, while chasing things that you could give up. You'll show them you are willing to fight and give them the best of your life. And may your prayer be every day. Lead me, Jesus. Because I can't do this alone. Father, lead me. Because I can do this alone. Lead me, Jesus.